you guys who are watching us online and for those of you who are listening through the phone, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth session of Environment Healthcare Educational Speaking Series. Speaker series. Um, and this program was funded by the New Horizons Program for Seniors. My name is Courtney Modest, if you didn't already know that. And the topic that we are talking about today is recognizing elder abuse. Today's speaker is Kamika Hillock. She's been our speaker for the last couple of um, conversations and, and talks now. Um, the presentation will be recorded and it will be later available for, on our YouTube channel. Um, the presentation is about 35 minutes long. If you have any questions, we'll have a question and answer period after with Kamika. Um, so I would like to again thank and welcome Kamika um, for joining us. She's a recent graduate from the business and me from media business and digital communications program at the University of Guelph, and she's super. She's super um, passionate about Canadian health services, especially partnering and um, partnering with us in the importance of one's personal autonomy. She's super. She's super excited to have this conversation with you, um, and it's very and some. So super excited to have this conversation with you with some very important topics. Um, that you will learn. So again, thank you again, Kamika, and the floor is yours. Perfect. So let me, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I love being able to come on here and having some insightful and very informative conversations with everyone. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Uh, share the screen here. Okay, perfect. So now let's put it in presentation mode. Awesome. So for today, we will be addressing the topic of identifying elder abuse. You're speaking so a little bit low, sir. I, I can I can bear I can almost can't hear you. Okay, the can you hear me? The last speaker was um, speaking better. Check your microphone. Check your volume settings. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, no worries. Thank you for thank you for pointing that out to me. So for today, we will be addressing the notion of elder abuse. So I want to I want to just advise a quick trigger warning as we will be speaking on a topic that may be sensitive for some. I am aware that speaking on topics such as this one can incite some negative and unwanted emotions. So I want to preface this before I move forward so that everyone on the call and anyone who's watching the video is aware. So we're gonna start with what constitutes elder abuse? So how do we recognize what elder abuse actually is? And furthermore, how do we yes, handle it? Hello? And furthermore, how do we handle it? The terms and elder abuse and senior abuse are often used to describe the experience of older adults who are abused, usually by someone they know and often by someone they care about. It is abuse whenever someone limits or controls the rights and freedoms of an older adult. The older adult is unable to freely make choices because they are afraid of being humiliated, hurt, left alone, or their relationship ending. Abuse causes harm to an older adult. The World Health Organization, WHO, defines abuse of older adults as a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there is an expectation of trust, which causes harm or distress to an older person. So who tend to be the abusers of elder adults? Abuse of older adults often occurs within the family by an adult, children, or grandchildren. However, other relatives, friends, um, neighbors, 
paid or unpaid caregivers, landlords, financial advisors, or any other individual in a position of trust and authority can be deemed as abusive as well. When a spouse is abusive, it is called domestic violence. So who is at risk? Most people would say, I never thought this would happen to me. Abuse can happen at any age and to any person. There are a number of risk factors that may be cause for concern, and I'm going to relay these right now. So isolation, whether it's physical, social, or cultural, history of domestic violence, either within the situation or within the family, shared living situations, for example, if you don't really have your own space, that can incite um, abuse to occur as well because everyone's kind of just stepping over each other. Dependency on an older adult for shelter or financial help. Addiction issues. Depression or other mental health issues or cognitive impairment. So... How do you recognize elder abuse? So there are, six, there are six kind of categories that I'm going to go through. So abuse happens in different ways and usually becomes worse if there is no help of some kind. Older adults can often experience more than one form of abuse. All abuse is serious and causes harm. So number one, we're going to go through financial abuse. My granddaughter moved in with me some time ago. I asked her to leave because she used my bank card to take money from me a couple of times. She said she has no place to go. I felt guilty and I let her stay, but I'm afraid that she will do it again. Another scenario, my younger sister lives with me since her husband died. I have worked hard and saved money for many years. She has threatened to end our relationship if I don't write a new will that leaves all of my savings to her. Another scenario here. Last week, my son-in-law asked me to sign a power of attorney so that he can help me with my affairs. He disagrees with the way in which I manage my money. And I have heard him tell my daughter that he thinks I'm getting senile. I'm a little afraid of him. It is financial abuse if someone tricks, threatens, or persuades older adults out of their money, property, or possessions. Sometimes the abuser might influence or force the abused to change their will, sign a power of attorney, or the abuser might cash checks without the person's knowledge. Next, we're gonna dive into psychological abuse. And for each category here, I have a couple scenarios so that it's able to, you're able to understand it from that perspective of having it kind of hit close to home. So, psychological abuse. I don't have a big family and have outlived most of my friends. My niece is the only family member I see regularly. She says I'm lazy and I should be thankful for every time that she comes to visit me. Scenario two, my husband controls my every move. He tells me I'm too stupid to make decisions or handle money. It is psychological abuse if someone threatens insults, intimidates, or humiliates an older adult, treats the person like a child, or does not allow them to see their family or friends. Next, we're going to move to spiritual or religious abuse. I know that when you think of, of, of abuse in general, you don't really think of this, or at least I didn't. Um, but let's go into scenario one. My daughter-in-law tells me that my spiritual tradition is 
quote unquote, ridiculous. And she has convinced my son to not let my grandchildren come to ceremony with me any longer. Scenario two, my brother doesn't want me to go to church anymore. I am afraid to disobey him, but the fellowship and my faith are important to me. It is religious or spiritual abuse when someone limits or restricts the spiritual practices, customs, or traditions of an older adult. Abuse also includes using an older adult's beliefs to exploit the person, attacking the person's beliefs, or not allowing the person to participate in religious events and or activities. Next, we're gonna move to sexual abuse. Scenario one, my husband has been very controlling. He has never hit me, but lately he pressures me for sex. He won't let me sleep until I give in. Scenario two, my nephew and his girlfriend live with me. They have sex anywhere, even if they please, and don't even close the door when I'm home. I have asked them repeatedly to be more private, but they laugh at me and call me an old prude. It is sexual abuse if someone forces an older adult to engage in unwanted sexual activity. This may include verbal or suggestive behavior, not respecting personal privacy and sexual intercourse. We're on to the last two. Number five is- Sorry guys, before you go on, um, I just wanted to let you know if anybody has any questions that like they wanna ask, but like, you know, are a little bit too like nervous and they don't wanna stop the presentation, you guys can always put it in the chat and then we'll get back to it in the, um, question and answer time. So maybe you don't want to forget your question or something. You can always just leave it in the chat and we'll get back to it at that time. Okay, sorry about that. No worries, thank you. So number five is neglect. My son suffered a brain injury when he was young and he has lived with me his whole life. He does help more now that I'm not able to get around very well but my daughter expects him to do everything and he just can't. She lives nearby, but is very busy. I haven't been able to get out for groceries for over a year at this time. Scenario two, I live in the basement of my brother's home. He is very successful and travels a lot. When he goes away, he locks me in. He says he's afraid that I will wander off. Even though he leaves food and things to read, I get very depressed if he's gone for more than a couple of days at a time. Neglect occurs when someone withholds care, food, and or emotional support that an older adult is unable to provide for himself or herself. Sometimes people providing care do not have the necessary knowledge, experience, or ability. Let's go back here. And number six, oops, let's go back. Sorry there, guys. Oops. So number six is physical abuse. Scenario one, my husband pulls my hair when he's angry, and yells that I don't listen to him. He has always yelled at me, but he never used to hurt me. Scenario two, I am not as independent as I used to be. I need help with certain tasks. My daughter helps me, but I am ashamed to admit that sometimes she shakes me and even hits me. It is emotional abuse if somebody hits an older adult or handles the person roughly, even if there is no physical 
injury. So we're going to go into the warning signs of abuse. So what do we look for? If you suspect abuse for either if you feel as though you yourself are being abused or somebody around you is being, ab uh, being abused, injuries such as bruises, sprains, scratches, broken bones, especially when the explanation does not fit the injury. Changes in behavior of an older adult, such as depression, withdrawal, or fear. Changes in regular social activity, such as missing church or other social events. Changes in living arrangements, such as previously uninvolved relatives or new friends moving in. Changes in financial situations, such as cancellation of service because the bills are not paid or things quote unquote disappearing from the home. Signs of neglect, such as no food in the house, being left alone for long periods of time, not having glasses or hearing aids that are needed, and or not having proper clothing. If you are suspective of abusive behavior, look for controlling behaviors. For example, not allowing adults to make their, their, their decisions as they feel, refusing to allow them to visit anyone alone, isolating them from friends and family, using the silent treatment to control them, not allowing them to use the phone, disregard for their privacy, locks on the outside of the bedroom door, reading or withholding their mail, which is an offense, guys. No one's allowed to, to open your mail. Handling all of the money. But how do you know if it is abuse, if it is truly abuse? It may be difficult to determine that abuse is taking place. Every situation is different. A warning sign does not automatically mean abuse is happening. Ask questions. Seek advice from experts on abuse. Avoid judgment and be respectful. And all in all, trust your instincts. So what can we do to stop elder abuse? Neighbors, friends, and family members can do these three things. See it. If it's not right, recognize the warning signs. Name it. That looks or sounds like abuse. Talk to the older adult. Check it. Is it abuse? What can I do to help? Ask questions. Check with experts about what to do next. Check for danger. Help with safety planning. So with See It, take your concerns seriously. Learn the warning signs. I am worried about my friend who hasn't been at the center in weeks. The last time I saw her, she seemed very anxious. Name it. Overcome your hesitation to help. Talk to the older adult you think may be abused without the person you think is abusive present in that moment about what you've seen or heard. Use non-judgmental language like, I haven't seen you at the center for some time now, and I know how important coming here is to you. You seem upset, and I miss seeing you. Just saying something as casual as this may incite for this person to let you know what's going on behind closed doors without sounding too judgmental. Check it. Ask questions. Are you okay? Do you feel safe? Is there anyone hurting you or making you feel uncomfortable? What do you want to do? How can I help? If you have immediate concerns about safety, call the police. So we're gonna go into a quick video here um, on elder abuse awareness. And then afterwards, we're gonna go into our question and answer period.
seniors are becoming reliant upon family and other caregivers to assist them in their day-to-day -day living. Unfortunately, this dynamic has led to an increasing number of elder abuse cases to occur. This includes physical harm, neglect, emotional abuse, and financial exploitation. Any older person can be a victim, regardless of gender, culture, race, or financial status. However, there are factors that place certain older persons at increased risk of being a victim and include problems with their mental capacity, social isolation, and dependence on others. Mental capacity is the ability to understand and appreciate information that will allow a person to be able to successfully make their own decisions. Some older persons may lack this capacity, however, due to age-related cognitive disease, such as dementia. Dementia is a syndrome where people have difficulties in a number of cognitive domains, trouble with their memory, trouble with processing information, trouble with reasoning and judgment, and being able to say, what was the advantage of this choice over that choice? And so they might get easily bamboozled if someone's giving them lots of choices or someone's giving them ideas about what they should do or not do that are not in their own best interest. Social isolation occurs when one's social networks are small and a person has very few people to speak to or confide in. And this often goes hand in hand with dependence. We have very few people that are uh, helping us out in life we have quite a bit of dependence on them and we put quite a bit of trust in them. And in the wrong hands, that relationship of trust can turn into a relationship of power and control pretty easily. Although there is no typical profile of a victim, the opposite is true for the abuser. Overwhelmingly, it's family. Over 40% of the time, it is an adult child, sons more often than daughters. Next is the spouse. And when you consider grandchildren and other relatives, the abuser is a family member over 90% of the time. It's very often the child who never really achieved independence. Uh, they never got out on their own, um, had trouble maintaining employment. It's typically that the younger person is dependent on the older person. And that dependency can be exacerbated by drug and alcohol abuse, or they may have kind of a failure to launch syndrome. Sometimes we talk about the unsuccessful son in the basement that moves in. Some of the other types of abusers that we see tend to be people who hold a position of power. So they may be a person who's a power of attorney. And so sometimes it's just actually people wanting to get a hold of the money. But even where people are very low income, elder abuse happens. So whether it's taking a pension check or whether it's making sure that they have access to debit cards for everyday expenses, greed can play a role. Unfortunately, elder abuse very often goes unreported. The majority of victims are either unwilling or unable to talk about the abuse with anyone, let alone report it to the police. They may fear the abuser and have fear of reprisal. Others may feel shame or embarrassment, be in denial of the abuse, not even recognize it as abuse, or have a dependency on the abuser. But most often, the older person actually feels protective towards the one abusing them. Considering they are so often family, these can be the closest or only relationships the senior may have, so they don't really want their family member to be arrested. We often see that there's a sense of obligation by the older person to the younger person. There's a sense that they have to take care of them. And on top of that, there can be a caregiver dependent type concern as well. The older person may in fact need the younger person to provide them with services, to provide them with health and personal care needs, to do shopping and so on. She may be dependent on them on, for caregiving supports. She may really not want to go into a nursing home. We have to consider that even though the older person is, is living in a situation that we would consider unhealthy or undesirable, um, this has become their life and this might be desirable when the alternative is no longer having that family member in their life anymore. So quite often older adults will make the decision, the conscious decision to remain in an unhealthy, um, even at times abusive relationship because it's better than no relationship at all. Financial abuse, which refers to the theft or exploitation of a person's money, property or assets, is the most commonly reported form of elder abuse. It is frequently committed by the senior's son or daughter or by their power of attorney. 
A power of attorney is a person who has been appointed by the senior, while mentally capable of doing so, to make certain decisions on their behalf when they become incapable of making those decisions themselves. In Ontario, there are two separate types of power of attorney. The power of attorney for personal care allows the appointed person to make medical, hygiene, shelter, and nutrition decisions for the person, and the power of attorney for property allows the designated person to make any property or financial transactions or decisions, except to write a will on behalf of the person. The responsibilities are to act in the best interests of the person, not the person's family, not the person's children, not the person's uh, dependents, but the person. But we know that sometimes these documents are abused, that the powers are exceeded, that attorneys act, si act outside of the powers granted. Often these power of attorney documents are not documents granted by a grantor, but rather fraudul fraudulently either procured and signed and used. If that person starts making withdrawals from bank accounts and selling off assets and then using that money for their own interest and it's not in the best interest of the other individual, that's a criminal offense. There is a general misconception that these sorts of disputes are strictly civil matters. However, this is not the case. The criminal code does provide legislation allowing you to intervene and lay charges which is often the best solution to stopping the abuse. So the way we can be most effective in this regard is just to remain switched on when you're at these um, quote unquote lower priority calls. These aren't gonna come across your screen as an elder abuse. They're going to be EDP calls, landlord tenant disputes, uh, check the well-being, noise complaints, these types of things. You're, you're really gonna to need to know what you're looking for and to be paying attention to see that deeper issues might be, might be going on. You'll want to take note of their home environment. Are there signs of social isolation? Are assistive devices such as walkers, canes, hearing aids, and eyeglasses being used, or are they broken and sitting in the corner or missing altogether? Are medications filled and up to date? What is their appearance like? Do they seem well taken care of? Is there a relative hovering over you, jumping in to answer questions on the senior's behalf? It's important to talk to the senior on their own, without distractions from others. This will allow you to get a clearer impression as to what their mental capacity may be, and if you feel they truly understand and appreciate the situation they are in. Start with lighter topics that are open-ended, just to get the conversation rolling and to establish a rapport. Eventually, build up to how they are doing, and then to your concerns about their situation. One of the biggest challenges we have in law enforcement when it comes to intervening into these scenarios of elder abuse is um, we have to deal with the concept of autonomy versus protection. Autonomy meaning people do have the right to self-determination and to make decisions on their own behalves. And when someone is mentally capable of doing so, we allow people to live at risk and make decisions that can put them at, in harm's way. Um, and at times this involves an individual choosing to remain in a relationship that is unhealthy, dysfunctional, uh, borderline abusive. And the other side of the coin is the protection aspect. And people who are not able for, because of cognitive impairment or perhaps a mental illness, um, they aren't able to appreciate the consequences of the decisions they're making. If they don't have that capability, um, we then as a state do have the responsibility to step in and protect them not going to be expected to decide whether this person's capable of choosing to ask the son to leave or ask the son to stay. You're not going to be asked to decide whether this woman's capable of managing her finances in such a brief time. But you might have some observations that would be helpful as to the fact that she seemed wary, she seemed confused, she seemed perplexed, and that her answers were consistent. Those wouldn't be red flags as to the fact that she might have some cognitive difficulties. So it's not just one answer that's going to give you an idea as to whether there's abuse going on, as to whether this person has cognitive the pyramid or as to whether this person lacks capacity. It's a picture that you're going to build up over time through observing, listening to the answers, and just getting a sense of the whole situation. As police officers, you're not legally qualified to assess an individual's mental capacity. There are healthcare specialists who do that. The question you really want answered is, what intervention is going to lead to the best result for the senior? So ask them, what are you hoping will happen? what outcome is desirable to you. Then present options and potential outcomes to the senior. Let them know, if we charge your son, 
this is what's going to happen. Or if he stays, maybe we can get you some help. Often we may have grounds to lay a criminal charge and the, the end result is going to be uh, breaking up that family unit and removing that individual from, from their son, perhaps for the rest of their life. Um, that may not be desirable to the individual. So it is a lot more complicated than, than recognizing what piece of legislation might be available to you. Um, sometimes the practical response is going to be more um, desirable to, to the victim than, than the heavier response. If you don't. So I want to stop the video there. And now we're going to move on to the next set of slides here. Okay, so I wanted to include this quote because I thought it was important for us to look at. Um, let me go into presenter mode one moment here. You know what, I'll just stay on here. So you don't have to wait for someone to repeat. You don't have to wait for someone to treat you bad repeatedly. All it takes is once. And if they get away with it that one time, if they know they can treat you like that, then it sets the pattern for the future. So if you feel as though um, what somebody is doing to you is wrong, it's classified as abuse, I know it's difficult, but try not to let them get away with it that first time. Um, you can go to either um, somebody who is somebody who you see, you can go to a doctor, you can go to somebody who you trust, a family member, you can go to your carer, um, you can go to anyone really um, and tell them about how you feel um, when a certain person is around you or when they say certain things to you. Um, there's so many people in place that you can go to if you need help. You can go to vibrant healthcare. Um, there's so many people around you. Um, so definitely exhaust your resources and make sure that you get out of a situation that is not, that isn't, that isn't good for you, whether that's mentally or physically. So question and answer time. I'd love to hear for, from you. I'd love for us to open the floor and have a respectful conversation. I know that um, this topic is very heavy and I want us to be able to respect each other's feelings if we are going to answer these questions, okay? So question number one, in your opinion, what do you believe is classified as elder abuse? Like what, what makes you feel as though either you are being abused or somebody else is being abused? This is the time you guys can unmute and answer um, the questions if you want. Um, one form of elder abuse actually be, should be called disabled abuse, and um, it should be the, the, it is ODSP. They're abusing all the people on ODSP because like, um, they like they not allowing people like me to go to work. So all the government wants to do is just take the money away if I get the job too quick, oh, or they okay. won't give me an allowance to manage the wheelchair. And they want to, the government wants to control too much. That's the problem too. This is true. You bring up an amazing point. Um, and that's a point that I didn't address in this in this slide um, is the governmental power and their abuse over people who are either disabled, as you said, people who um, may have mental disabilities, even just people who are just the government in general does have amazing power and they are able to abuse people in ways that we don't really think about. So I, I thank you so much for bringing up that point. Does anybody else have a point that they'd like to make? Which is why we should change the topic, which is why we should change the topic from elder abuse. It should be elder disabled abuse. And that's what it should be called elder disabled abuse dot gc dot ca because it's because it's because it's both. Oh, perfect. I think we I think we're actually gonna touch on this topic again. Um, I believe either next month or the next month. So we'll definitely be sure to include that. All righty, and number two here. Um, what things do you believe those around you can do to reduce the risk of elder abuse and disabled abuse? Let's tie that in there as well. So what can the people around you do to prevent this from happening? What can us in this group help with to prevent this from happening to anybody? I don't know if it's called abuse. If somebody in the younger generation is always correcting when you say something that's not exactly right, is that called abuse? 
It it is. It is because um they're essentially saying that your opinion doesn't matter. It's not right. Um, and they are lessening your your autonomy and your right to say what you'd like. Um, so for example, in in my life as well, um, I can speak on my personal experience. Um, I've seen some of the younger generation in my family um, when my grandmother was alive, kind of just not let her have the right to speak. They always felt that what she was saying was outdated, it wasn't right, and she didn't have the right information. And looking back now, when I when I when I'm able to have hindsight, because hindsight is a beautiful thing, you're able to see in the scenarios in which you were in that were not right. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't correct. So to me, I look at that as emotional abuse because you now feel like, okay, well, is what I'm saying wrong? Is what they're saying right? Do I not have a right to speak? So I would definitely classify that as emotional abuse for sure. What, what do you do? What do you say to this person? Um, in, in my last um, set of slides, we were actually talking about um, how to deal with people who think they know what's right for you or people that think they know what's right in general. And I think that the best thing to do, if it's something that's overbearing, to speak to somebody about it, whether that is, if, if, if the younger generation, whether that is like their parent or somebody else who like a caregiver, um, vibrant, just st talking to somebody. And also one thing that I found too in my last set of slides is agreeing to disagree. Because at the end of the day, um, not everybody is going to agree on the same thing. So if that younger person feels like what they're saying is right, um, a lot of the time they're just looking for a reaction from you. And when you don't give them that that reaction, it stops them in, 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 in their tracks for a second. Because I can say that my cousins were looking for a reaction from my grandmother. And if she was to not give give that reaction to them, it, it makes them pause because they're not getting the reaction that they were looking for. So agreeing to, to, to disagree is an amazing thing to do. Otherwise, talking to somebody else about it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for posing that. Thank you. All right. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Kiko. No, no, no. Um, was anybody else going to speak? Yeah, there's actually a... Um question in the chat that says if you witness elder abuse where can you report it especially if it is not in your family setting yes perfect um so as the video kind of stated um it's best to um either speak to somebody about it or report it when the abuser is not present so if you're able to kind of get away from that scenario you can either contact the police, you can contact a social worker, you can contact Vibrant Healthcare because all concerns are valid. Um, so if it's not within your household, you can still address it. Um, and and as, I, as, as the video also talked about, and as I talked about um, before, um, we may look at certain scenarios and think, yes, this person is definitely getting abused. Like for, for example, um, in certain households, screaming, yelling, shouting, that's like the norm. So I think it's also important to ensure that what is happening is, is abuse for, for, for foremost, and also to follow your instinct. So telling a social worker, calling the police, um, calling vibrant healthcare, calling somebody, um, just anybody that's kind of in more of a power of attorney um, position. So I'd like to open the floor to any questions or comments that you guys have that I may not have touched on. I'd love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, uh, my presentation is over and I'd like to thank you guys so much for listening. All right, if nobody has any questions for Kamika, um, I would like to say, Thank you for everybody. Thank you to her for coming to um, and joining us and talking to us about elderly and disabled abuse. I think what she's talked about was very insightful, and I think we've all learned a lot. Um, our next topic is next Tuesday, June 15th, and it is going to be on computer literacy at 11, 11 a.m. as just like this one. If you'd like to invite your friends or anything like that, I would really urge you to do so because as you can see this is you know it's very incitive and something that um i think everybody should be you know um getting into especially the with this time and corona uh, covid just kind of keeping us all inside it's just a great way for us to stay connected um 
again, I would like to thank Mika and I would like to thank all of you guys for coming to join us. Um, if you have any questions, you guys can come, you guys can ask, um, ask, you guys can message them to us, email them to us and then we'll forward them to Kamika. Um, if anybody, if any, if there's nothing else, I would again, I'd like to say thank you guys so much and I'll see you guys next week. I'm, I'm just wondering, are you gonna keep the summary of all this stuff? Yes, yeah, so we are gonna keep the um presentation and it's gonna be up on our YouTube channel. So you guys can just um you guys can um go back and watch it whenever you feel like it is whenever you feel yeah. like you need a reminder, Douglas. And what about having besides the YouTube channel, but having other information like for example, like the slides or other information like summaries and stuff like that, that like they might be PDFs, words. Um so. yeah, we could try we could totally try to get um some of these slides out to you if you would like we'll try to figure that out and then we'll um we'll figure it out for you okay douglas like like for example yeah. all the stuff could be on let's say www.vibranthealth.ca slash courses slash um talk series slash you know and then elder abuse you know what i mean okay. yeah that sounds good that sounds like a really good idea we'll try to figure that out and hopefully we can get that out before the end of the year yeah, because that would make good sense because let's say um, when I was first getting into the course, I was trying to find the information from the previous sessions. They weren't found. That should have been in the, when, when I got that initial link, it should have, I should, it should have been a second link to the course and then it has everything there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, um, it's not something that it's kind of like, because just because it's like, you know, all these like information, we don't want... <clears throat> anybody else's information to be out there and we just kind of have to get it all composed properly and like you know with our restrictions and all of them following all the rules so hopefully we can get that out before um the end of the year and um you could um have access to some presentations douglas okay perfect no other questions guys um again i would like to thank you guys so much for coming to join us and we'll see you again next week um june 15th for computer computer literacy um conversation with miss nikki matthews all right guys thank you so much um again i'd like to thank mika um yeah all right guys bye see you guys next week thank you for having me. Thank you. bye 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 everybody